How you doing? I'm Mike Shu. Welcome to the Road to Legalization, uh, our second installment, this video podcast, and we talk about uh, the marijuana legalization issues, progress with that, and progress with medical marijuana dispensaries. And today, uh, we're talking to Mike Can, a longtime marijuana reform activist and also a medical marijuana patient. Uh, we're talking to Mike Adams, my colleague here, who works down the hall at WEEI. Uh, and uh, you're on at night. Is that correct, Mike? Yes, I am. <laughs> Six to ten. There you go. Mm -hmm. And then Chris Foy on the end here. Chris, uh, also a member of MassCan, a longtime marijuana reform activist. So thank you for uh, joining us today, gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to start out with uh, Mike Can here. Mike also writes uh, The Blunt Truth for Dig Boston. And uh, you have been really following closely the progress of uh, the licensing process, and the progress of uh, medical marijuana dispensaries here in Massachusetts. And from what I've read from your articles, uh, things are getting kind of messed up. And I, I kind of brought this up in the last video podcast that it's starting to look like the big dig to oh, me. Oh, yes. That, that's they're, start, a, yeah. they're starting to realize that there's a lot of money involved in this, and some people are starting to gum up the process. And it's becoming that old Massachusetts, who you know, get my cousin a job kind of thing. Yeah. And uh, a good example was in your latest uh, column in, in The Dig about uh, the D'Angelo brothers. Correct. And these are guys who have had much success in medical marijuana dispensaries, especially in Oakland. Yes. And they've been involved in a long time. They know the ins and outs. They've uh, seen all the problems and found a lot of solutions, yet they can't get any ground here yeah. in Massachusetts. And, and why is that? Well, they, they got awarded the, the provisional license, and, and, the, and the real story was about the media. The media is not focused on, on the real story, that they're the leaders in this medical marijuana dispensary, you know, this, this whole program. They have served a million patients. They have the best dispensary in America on a large scale, and they're being ignored because Stephen is a felon. Now, and, what he got arrested for selling medical marijuana. Correct. After he passed an initiative in Washington, D.C., um, that the Congress overruled. So he passed a law, him and his brother and some other folks passed a law in uh, D.C., and then it was overturned. It was overturned by the Congress, and he was arrested for supplying cannabis to his brother and other patients. And for someone to be denied a license over this, it's kind of ridiculous. Like, we want them in Boston. They're the best. They've proven it with what they did in Oakland. So why wouldn't we want them in Boston? What you know, we would we not want not want Martha Stewart here because she's a felon? Hmm. I mean, we we want that business. <laughs> Let me think about you know, that question. for a minute. Yeah. 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 Or you know, name somebody. I don't know. I'm sure there's some famous felons out there. You know, whether it's Jay, Jay Z or whoever, Snoop Dogg. You know, why, why wouldn't we want that person if they're the best in their field? And this is the field that we're talking about: medical cannabis. We should want them in Boston. Yeah, but these are the parameters that were set up by the Department of Public Health. Now, if you if you have a criminal record, it's kind of like a, a, the gun law. You know, would you want someone in charge of a firearm that has a criminal record? Would you want someone that has a criminal record in charge of dispensing medicine? Well, I don't. I don't think it was totally has been totally determined that they will be excluded because of that. Number one, and I think that the issue I had was about how the media, the media was just slanting the story. They're not talking about patients. They're not talking about real issues. They're not talking about that these are the most qualified guys. All they talked about was Stephen was a felon over and over and over. Every single day, the Herald and the Globe, that's all they reported. Where's the rest of the story? Where's the story about what they've done in California? That wasn't presented, and that's what the story was really about, was the media. And I feel that we should welcome them in Boston. Based on their past history, we should welcome it. We should at least um, welcome it as patients. And I think that's the other message that I had for the Boston media lately in the dig is that we're not getting patient coverage. The patients, we're talking about uh, dispensaries open in the summer. We've been waiting for a year and a half since the law passed. Now it's not even summer. It's fall. It's winter. It's 2015. When are we going to get medicine for patients? We passed this initiative. The politicians and the media are the ones that are screwing it up. And I really appreciate what you're doing, Mike Shue, because you're giving us a voice on this like no one else. And I, I really well, I appreciate you, the, you guys showing up. Thank you. So, and well, uh, as far as as that goes, um, do you think it's because the D'Angelos are from out of town? Is that a big thing? A lot of these companies are coming in; they're from out of town. They're having seems like they're having a hard time, and someone like William Delahunt not really having so much of a hard time. He's kind of already had the connections built in. 
you know, and started this supposed management company that's going to be, that got three licenses, I believe. Right, so you think that coming out of town, like we're being the suspicious mass holes here that, uh, you know, we don't need your help from out, out of the state. I think there's a lot of good things going on. It, there's, you know, in Massachusetts, we know that there's a lot of hacker, you know, hackerama, right? Isn't that what Howie Carr calls it, hackerama? So we're all expecting it, and, and we kind of see it. We know it's there, and this is the system that's been set up isn't the best system. It's kind of been set up in a, in a weird way, but... For a patient, we want them to open. We want everybody to open. I, I, I don't care who opens. You know, there seems to be a fight in this community among uh, the people who were awarded the licenses and the people who got shut out. I think we should open them all. Let's just open them all. We need as many of these places open as possible. We need them for patients. Go ahead, Mike. Well, I'm, I'm all for that. In fact, I, I think it should be an over-the-counter uh, medicinal situation for people in that, you know, uh, you can get it anywhere. If the government nationally legalized marijuana across the whole country, of course there'd be a national tax on it. And I say use that money to build prisons for the people who bring the real hard drugs into the, into the uh, country and to close off the revenue flow to people from out of the country who are taking that money and burying it underground, selling marijuana in the illegal fashion. Make it national, take half of it for taxes. Build prisons, let everybody get it, have it distributed like uh, alcohol uh, in, a, in a legal, you know, governed uh, situation and and then not only will you boost some revenue by the way i'm running for president in 2020 <laughs> it's called a perfect vision friends 2020 mikey for president and this is going to be my main platform plank because for years now the money's just been disappearing out of the economy people have been able to get it without committing a crime the jails are filled with people who are dealing with marijuana issues let's go let's smarten up here i mean it's when was woodstock 69 for god's sake let's get real with this thing it's not uh, heroin and Chris, we talked about last time, if they legalized it, I mean, how, how much would that affect uh, the violence and the, the, the drug cartels in Mexico and the stuff going on down there? Well, I mean, <clears throat> the majority of the marijuana is already in, in country, you know. The best weed in the world is, is grown in America. And uh, the, the cartels down south are, you know, trying to get that last gasp of uh, profit, I think. You know, it's really, they're really trying to control their, what they can control because they know they're not going to have control much longer. And uh, the, you know, like the legitimizing, legitimizing the industry is what's going to, you know, stop that violence and is what's going to stop the, uh, the just black market sales and going to get that money back into the economy. And, uh, you know, the problems that we're dealing with, like even the problems where, uh, you know, Mike, you wrote about D'Angelo, he's that if, if he should have never been a felon in the first place, you know, like the you, it's a ne very narrow sighted view of the situation calling a man like that a felon. You yeah. know, he's proud of it. He's proud of it. And he should be, you know, he, he risked his life. He risked his livelihood and he risked some time and, and the felon status sticks and he's proud of it. And he saved people's lives. How about this for irony, too? Uh, under my plan, 2020 America, it will be grown in the prisons. Yeah. Prison systems will become the marijuana uh, production <laughs> groups. By the way. Uh, the prisoners by then won't be the marijuana smokers, but they'll be a lot happier for no matter what crime they committed, being in prison, growing. And the other thing is, Wouldn't that want, way you got more free people want to be, want, want to go to prison. <laughs> well, that way you know the, the free labor. Now you can take all the profit and put it into if you want drug education, you know, uh, into prison, ed any kind of education. Yeah. Uh, and, and and well, that's what they're doing. Marijuana. That's what they're doing in Colorado. Yep. They're they're taking the first what was it, uh, forty million, I think, or something to that effect, and putting it into. Uh, the back end of the but school. It kind of has to be national to avoid the, the potential crime aspect of crossing state borders with it or being able to get in your airplane flying Absolutely. from Denver, Colorado to Seattle or somewhere where, you know, in other words, you don't want to have to deal with it as a legal issue at all. I mean, I don't know. Uh, I'd like to envision a, uh, a society progressing into a fact where we wouldn't need as many prisons, uh, you know as we take away these laws that are creating criminals that shouldn't be, cr you know, shouldn't yep. be criminals. And, uh, you know, I think the uh, the rise of the privatized prison is a dangerous uh, slope that we're uh, dancing on. Although they do release a lot of felons now that have been, uh, you know, in for rape and murder. They, they, in California, they let them out because they don't have room for them. So, uh, you know, it, it's, it's potential for solving a whole bunch of different problems. But the key one is, of course, the decriminalization aspect so that you can unclog the court system. Don't befuddle people with nonsense when there's so many important things that aren't being uh, taken care of right now uh, from a government standpoint. All right, and then and to go back to the the medicinal marijuana, to get to the, get it to the people who who really need it, 
for real. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, we, we all like to smoke weed and yeah. we all like to have a good time, but that there are people that are in pain, that need it for pain relief, that need it because they're going through chemotherapy. And, and I want to kind of go back to that because you are a patient. Yes, I Mike. am. And so what, what do you use medical marijuana for? I use it for daily pain. I was an athlete, uh, high school wrestling, you know, all-star in Massachusetts, uh, Triton High School, Bridgewater State wrestling. Um, bad, bad backs. I, I'm in daily constant pain for like the last 16, going on 17 years. Uh, no pills, no spinal surgery, even though I'm, I've recently gone back and considered it, spinal fusion, and uh, several other surgeries they want me to do, which I eventually might do, but cannabis has allowed me to keep working. It's allowed me to get the energy and live a normal life and not be all whacked out on those prescription drugs. If I had taken, you know, codeine and Tylenol and all those other things for 17 years, I, I don't know if I'd be here right now. Well, and how long have you been taking medical marijuana? For, for that long, for, for as long as I've had this pain, which I guess I'm going on. When I recently look back, it was year 17 I'm going on. And, uh, you know, I've, my condition, I look at it as kind of mild, and it does help. Like, my pain hurts. It's bad. I have nerve pain, all the rest of it. And, um, but some of the people that I meet and the conditions, hundreds of people, people have died. You know, one of my friends that I have a picture of right here, you know, speaking of running for office, I was thinking about running for office in 2016 for this legalization. And I want you to endorse me, <laughs> if you will. And Mr. Shu. KMP, um, we brought him up. Yeah, the last my month. friend, oh, he passed right. away. Right. He's another okay. patient, you know, like Michael Malta, the king of pot, we called him. And he's just the most magical person like Michael. Yeah, <laughs> Michael Mike. His name was Mike, too. You know, we're Mike everyone now. Mike today. But uh, so many people have passed away that I've no waiting for this medicine to be legal, that wanted it to be legal. We need to make it legal as soon as possible so more people don't die in the meantime, and I really mean that. My brother-in-law has multiple myeloma. He's been dealing with it for a year, and he's always in pain. He's had dialysis going on at the same time. And, you know, the medical marijuana part of it, he's okay with it, but he lives in Connecticut, so it's not like you just drive down the corner store. That's the whole problem with it. You know, people, for, for whatever reason, people use it. We know that alcohol is legal, uh, alcohol, people drink you know, four shots of tequila. There's nothing you can't do uh, that won't get you arrested when you do four shots of tequila. You drink six beers, you can run over somebody on the way home, go home uh, aggressively if you got a problem mentally, you know, beat your wife. People don't smoke marijuana and drive 90 miles an hour on the highway and, and crash into stuff. They don't go home and, and smack their spouse or, or become aggressive jerks. That's just something we've known over 50 years of experimentation. And the fact of the matter is, that alone should just put it on the back burner as far as a government priority. And that's why we've won the people, because of exactly what you said, that that life experience that we've all had. Why, why doesn't the government get it? Why doesn't the mainstream Even media get that? it's just keeping you in a good mood, you're better off uh, you know, uh, than uh, many other substances. I mean, you know, you, I, you get home, you smoke uh, some pot, you watch Leave it to Beaver, you have 10 Oreos and a glass of milk. Just I mean, 10? It's a good day. Well, this is exact. When I go like this, that's oh. 10. That's the most I can grab oh, out of the okay. box at once. Okay. <laughs> and then you're on time to work tomorrow. All right. right. Yeah. Well, um, what what needs to be done? What what changes do you think need to be made to the process now through your observations of uh, licensing for, for, medical? for medical marijuana Open them up. Open these guys up as soon as possible. Like, people need to be contacting city councilors. But this. don't you think if you move quickly... Um, this is also a health issue. I mean, if you move quickly, um, things could be overlooked, regulations could be overlooked, people could end up being hurt maybe, uh, instead of the baby steps or, even, I know it's a painful this process is, This now, is a non, you, you know, my, I know that you agree with me. This is a non-toxic substance. It's a, it's a very mild medicine. Um, there's gonna be safety and regulations that, you know, when you have some a group like the D'Angelo's opening, they have their own safety and regulations. They made the regulations. Yeah, I know. They were pioneers you know? in regulating. And, yeah. and, and, and I think that once we have enough avenues, people are going to figure out where the good places to go are. And I, I think that we just need to get enough of them open. I think that people are so caught up in safety and regulations. Those are going to exist. Those are going to be there. Those have already exist. But we can't wait. The longer we wait, the, the less likely it's to, to happen. And these, like, these folks are going to run out of money soon. Like These dispensary groups have been, for a year and a half, it costs $675,000 for one group just to bid to get that permit. And now they've got a license, you know, a, a whole cultivation center, and they've got to get storefront, and now they're told that the storefront won't work for the permit. All right, for people people don't know, it's a lot of cost. it has to be an all-in-one operation. They have to grow their own. 
they have to make all their own baked goods. Mm -hmm. It all has to be on premises, right? Is yep. that yes. the deal? And how yeah. much, how many millions of dollars would you have sit there for that long before you give in, before you throw in the towel and say, it's just not worth it, we can't open? Well, I think you can look to the recent uh, representatives from various casinos who have come into the state and, example, and, yeah. and have come in and said, Ugh, all right, we've spent millions of dollars, we're getting nowhere, let's just go back home, no, we're this, doing this, fine already. The state does that. They love to do the big dance, not just the big dig with people, and uh, and find out how many different ways they can reach their hands into the into the, uh, to the safe, you know, and try to grab more revenue out of it. It's it's pathetic. The problem is the people in the, in the state, for the most part, are on board with the whole thing, except that the government's going to say, well, it's my shake of the action. And that's where it gets sickening in every realm in the state. Yeah, because it's, it's, it, to them, it's not about these people who actually need it, legitimately need it. No. Yeah. It never is. You know, we, we talked about that last time. Is um, <clears throat> I had said, uh, you know, the best thing we can do for patients is legalize. But that does not help the patients that need it right now. You know, it's, there's people dying. There's people living in pain every day. And... Uh, you know, we, morally, we have to advocate for them, you know, because, they, you know, a lot of people, they can't do it themselves. Uh, they don't have the means to do it themselves. And uh, they're just in too much pain to even get out of bed. And, uh, you know, legalization will end the debate of medis medical, this, that, the other thing. And, uh, but, it, yes, it does. Yeah, not. because it's not just about legalizing. It's about prescribing. And there's just too many doctors arguing about it. And that's just another kind of speed bump, I guess you could say getting it to the right people it really is you know uh the the system itself you know i mean just my personal observation of you know the system you know from my military experience to uh my activism you know has been it's set up so things can't change you know it's like it's set up to protect itself and it's set up to keep the system moving you know they don't they don't like you know wrenches in the gears and uh this is what this is this is a grassroots organization you know a grassroots movement to put a wrench in uh yeah, by the people. gear by the people right i mean it started by the people finished by the people voted by the people it didn't come from any part I, I i've been working with a lot of politicians over the years and some support us but Lucky it didn't you. come from any of them <laughs> yeah that can be but it didn't come from them it came from us it came from you you no, talking me, about you, you talked me. about it oh for years uh you know ever since the car wash yeah, can we talk about that a little bit? Sure, I don't. You mind. had a little trouble with the law there, Mikey Adams. I know that surprises a lot of yeah, people. Yeah, because uh, I'm a good boy. But you I had am. you had you were arrested. Yeah, I was on my way home from my uh, nightly TV show on uh, the New England Cable News Channel that I used cable, to watch. Cable operation in the basement. Oh, you were. The I guy. was in the basement back then. <laughs> Actually, yeah, you know, I wasn't a medical basement. user then. <laughs> so I get to a, uh, you know, my car was dirty. It was. Two in the clock in the morning, and I, was, I saw the, the Mr. Sparkle car wash in Vernon, Connecticut. And I said, I'll just pull in, throw some quarters, and vacuum the car out. Because that's one time I got home anyway. So I go in there, and I start vacuuming. I got the doors all open, the mats around the roof. And I'm in there, you know, huffing and puffing with a dollar and a minute to vacuum. All of a sudden, I feel a tap on my shoulder, and it's Officer uh, Bumstead, or whatever his name was, uh, saying, what are you doing? I got the hose going. It's loud as hell. That's amazing. What am I well, doing? What does it look I, like you're doing? I'm baking I, a cake. I didn't know I had <laughs> weed in the car, so I just was, I said, I put it on his shirt. I went, you know, like the, I said, what do you mean, what am I doing? I vacuumed him. I thought he was kidding. Uh, he backs me up, shines a light in the back seat down the corner. The back was a little twisted baggie that I didn't even know was there. It was in the back seat, you know. I, I keep my weed in the golf bag, in the <laughs> trunk. I, I didn't think. Thanks for letting everybody know. Good place. A yeah. good place for it. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so I, he says, pull that out of there. And I pull it out. And there's you know, a little bag, a little bud, and a roach in there. And he said, what's that? What's that? Uh, I said, it looks like pot to me. You know? And he said, okay. And he handcuffs me. Well, the killer to that was it was a tiny amount of weed. I didn't know it was there. Not that I didn't smoke. You know, I wasn't playing, pretending I was innocent or anything. But uh, it, because I was on TV and had been in Hartford, it was in eight newspapers that I got busted for weed. I was in a, the Current and the Springfield paper, the Globe and the Herald. It was in all kinds of papers. The USA Today. The state by state, they must have had a light day. <laughs> Connecticut, sportscaster busted. You know, and it's like, oh, man, me and my grandmother at 99 years old. <laughs> so I was like, this is ridiculous. Uh, and then, of course, when, when the charges were dropped weeks later, there's a little tiny thing in the paper like this. Yeah, they never come back and no. say sorry. Yeah, uh, no. yeah. Oh, you know, so really was a career, not an ender, but it, 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 it was a detour for my career because I worked for a button-down news operation, and they didn't want any of their on-air anchors, uh, you know, uh, uh, completely exposed as pot smokers, you know. But 
it, it was really kind of was keeping me sane. I was driving 86 miles each way every day to commute to this job, and I was just beat. And I had family in Connecticut and driving up here. Um, and it was a therapeutic thing for me, uh, having pot. That pot wasn't mine. But, I mean, I, I, I admitted that I smoked it every single day. It's like, well, no big deal. It shouldn't be a big deal anyway. You know? Well, I think it's, it's not as, well, I like to think it's not as big as deal, a big a deal now as it was then. No, and, and that's true. And, you know, now it's, it's again, because at least in this state, well, it's less than an ounce now is decriminalized mm -hmm. and, and so on. And I think, you know, that, that's just kind of like taking the obvious and dealing with it. But back then it became, and this was 94, so it wasn't that long ago, 20 years ago. Uh, I mean, I'm glad it wasn't 74 because I would have been doing prison time for it. You <laughs> yeah, know, really. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, how? So you said that was a career ender, but just for uh, New England Cable News Network. Yeah, and I stayed there for the, the remainder of my contract. I mean, uh, they, they, well, they didn't fire me or anything, but everybody knew. I get, and then I, to this day, I get calls on the air, you know, for people poking fun of the Rasta man, you know, and all <laughs> this stuff, you know, and it, it, which is fine. I don't care. It doesn't bother me even a little tiny bit, but certainly it's a. Uh, ESPN wasn't going to call me after that, you know. I so you here. so you think that that arrest affected your career? Oh, yeah. You could have. Yeah. Did it ruin? You think it ruined opportunities? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm not. I don't consider myself a handsome or good-looking or capable anchorman on TV, but I was on a roll at that you time. Were. I had won yeah. Emmys. I, I I had a good contract. You know, a six-figure contract, making good money. Uh, you know, I'd been at a national network on on. Uh, uh, the ESPN Classic Sports Network, and, and uh, things were looking good. But after that, it wasn't like I was going to replace anybody, you know, because uh, they could just easily find out that I had had that bust, you know. So it, it is a, it is a, it was a dampener. But now, um, you seem to be doing all right. I, I, Terrific. Yeah. I do, I'm better with radio, you know. I mean, my face, I look like a blocked punt. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. I was never going to be national yeah, not with his face, but <laughs> so. And All right. That's you know, it's crazy to think you know, twenty years, you know, I mean, if if that had happened, you know, now stay and yeah. uh, say you were on that you know professional role. Yeah. How do you think it would be a different scenario? Well, it would have been a, a fun Twitter adventure for everybody. <laughs> that's right. Uh, yeah. It would have been forgotten as the news cycle has shortened over the years. Here today, gone tomorrow. You know how quickly we forget all these little incidents that. Everybody's, oh, wow, you know. Now people just push that stuff aside and uh, go on to the next phase of their life. Uh, it's a lot different now. I think it wouldn't, uh, in uh, the recent, a recent Gallup poll I read about saying 58% of Americans would approve of legal marijuana, so I don't think the public would really consider it. Well, I don't think much of the public would consider it too much of a story. Well, but think we, about this. Three straight presidents have come clean to the point where at least they have inhale or not, admitted that they smoke pot. That's three presidents in a row. Yeah, and a lot of pot, too. Yeah, and and they cocaine. They a lot of pot. Uh, you know, yeah, I, yeah with, it's cocaine. But three presidents in a row, and you think about the guys that were before them, you know, George Herbert Walker and oh, yeah. Ronald, Ronald Reagan, and, you know, Jimmy. It's The times have, have definitely changed. That they Now they're just admitting it. They're, they're not admitting that they do it now. Although I wouldn't be surprised if Obama doesn't... Uh, <laughs> Light one up once in a while. Well, I would I imagine know, it's a stressful maybe? job, you know. Yeah. Yeah. It takes a little I mean, really. The presidents are a perfect example, as you say. You know, it's like if any one of them had been unlucky enough to catch, you know, a bad night like you did, you know, they wouldn't be the president. You know, they that would have been a career ender for them. You know, and uh, that it's it's like a. a across the board game of Russian roulette where like who's gonna get popped, who isn't gonna get popped, whose life's, you know, who's gonna, you know, and, and the racial divides are there too. You know, if you get popped in a, uh, you know, a the wrong neighborhood and you're, you're the wrong skin color, you might get, you're, you're gonna go to jail. Whereas, you know, suburban kids just having fun are just gonna get a ride home, you know? And it's, it's the, the power of corruption is in the laws, you know, of the drug war. And legalization has taken those corrupt, you know, powers away from them. And the cops don't even care about it really now anymore. They don't. They, yeah. they, it's really not them trying to do anything. They, they just they'll they'll turn a, turn a, a blind eye to it more often than they'll actually take someone in on that that kind of thing. The rank and file, definitely. Yeah. Maybe not the bosses. You know, that's the difference. I think is the rank and file. They get it. Well, it's it's it's. I think it's just going more towards that legitim legitimization. You know, the president's admitting to it. You know, police may be backing off on yeah. it a little bit. You know, you remember Robert Parrish got the UPS oh, package? Yeah. Oh, that yeah. was a huge deal. Yeah, I mean, but hey, you know. world champion. I know. 
And then he wrote that no book right after. Then he wrote Oakland that. Was buying he wrote the book stuff, right you know? after. Remember? You know, did you read Paris's book? No, I didn't. Uh, it's convenient. called Pick and Roll My Way. <laughs> <laughs> That's convenient. It was called Me and My Seven Foot Joint. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, we. Uh, we have yeah, to wrap it up here, man. but um, thank you, gentlemen, very much for uh, sitting in on the road to legalization. This is uh, Chris Foy, Mike Adams, Mike Can. Uh, also, uh, just really quickly, because uh, I want to plug the website, but you guys had elections. MassCan had elections. Yes, MassCan is an organization. We uh, elected our uh, new board for 2014. We have uh, new faces, and we have some re, uh, you know, coming back old faces, and uh, we're going to push for a really good year this year. Uh, you can uh, see anything coming up on uh, masscan.org, but also check out the organization Bay State Repeal. We're going to be working together with uh, MassCan and Bay State Repeal to uh, be launching our 2014 uh, PPQ initiative signature gathering here in the next couple uh, you know, weeks and uh, months, and uh, that's what we're looking for help with. Get involved. All right. Well, thanks again, gentlemen, for sitting in the road to legalization. And uh, thanks for watching here at WAF.com. Uh, if you have any comments or anything, feel free to leave your comments, suggestions, or you can email them to me at hsu at waaf.com. Thanks.